All right, what's up, everyone? And welcome to part two of Alternative Investing with Edwin Tracy or Edwin the Magic Engineer. Say hi, Edwin. Hi, everybody. How's it going? All right, guys. So in the very first episode, we covered a general theme about alternative investing or investing in finance in general. And I want you guys to kind of catch that episode first before watching this, right? Don't cheat because... I really want you to know the insights, the nuggets that this guy is sharing before we come to this part. But you know what? All good. If you are really wanting to get into the into the bones, to get into the bones of this particular episode, then and you're already kind of itching to find out more about this alternative investment called Magic the Gathering, then this episode is for you. So, Edwin, so Last, we covered the overarching financial uh, aspects about the economy and then why you started investing, um, right. how's your, your principles and approach. Now, yeah. today, we're going to be very, very specific. And this is the part where I, I'm getting very, very excited. So Magic the Gathering was something that I started just last year. May 2019, I'm just a baby, right? And obviously, because I came back into Magic, your channel right? Edwin the Magic Engineer was one of the channels that I actually started watching, right? Oh, and yeah. yes, and, and so lo and behold, I actually have the uh, privilege of interviewing you today. And you know, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm from a finance background myself. I, I was a, a banker for six and a half years and I left, um, I think I left five years ago and mm-hmm. I decided that I wanted to um, step in to a alternative investment. And the only reason why I stepped back into Magic because I used to play it. And I was very surprised that after 25, 27, is it 27 years? That 26. The game, 26 years. The yeah. game is still around. And not only that, it has a very large market cap. But however, yes. it's very hard to determine that. So, People have no idea how large the market cap is. Exactly. And that's kind of like where I kind of want to want to let people know because a lot of people just think that oh okay it's just a trading card game or we call it tcg or a ccg right so people mm-hmm. didn't really take it seriously at the time so could you kind of give us a little bit of back history um on how you started oh and then from then right what yeah. made you you know currently now still playing still playing the game loving the game creating mm-hmm. content building a community around it and what makes you so passionate about it? And, and of course, naturally, what made you also put in serious money? We're not going to go into the details, but what okay. made you, with your level of expertise, right, put in serious money into mm-hmm. this alternative investment come hobby? Please okay. share. Yeah. Okay. So that's a lot of questions. I'll, I'll start <laughs> at what, why I'm passionate about it. And sure. the passion, that's an easy one to answer. It's because the game unto itself is, as I believe, one of the best games, if not the best game that I've ever ran into. And I'm an avid gamer. I mean, I've, I used to design gaming motherboards. I mean, I've, I do LAN PC gaming. I've done all types of board games. I've done all kinds of like card games. I've never ran into anything that I think is a better game design than Magic. And, and then of course, like, you know, that gets boxed in based on what format you play and what cards you have and stuff like that. But you know, the creativity and the diversity and just the, the raw skill that can come in with building and playing a deck. I mean, I'm, I like solving puzzles. I like complicated things. And so for anyone with my kind of personality, where like, there's a bit of fantasy, but there's complexity and there's even kind of a collecting trading thing. And all these things came together. I mean, magic was just it. So I, I was introduced by a cousin when I was in college and um that was right around the time of like ice age alliances so like 1996 and when i came into it i was like instantly hooked and my cousins would laugh because they were younger than me because like you know they introduced me to the game and then like four months later i show up at their house with like a time twister deck with black vices and it's like comboing out and i had full power nine and duels and all this other stuff so i just dove in but at that time, I was buying dual lands for 20 bucks each. You know, Moxes were 150 Lotus. My first Lotus, I think, was 300 that I paid for, stuff like that. That was already, <laughs> like, at the time in college, that felt very expensive. But it was still, it was, it was nothing compared oh, wait, to, like... How much know, is the Lotus now, Edwin? 
Well, my unlimited Lotus, mine is a played signed Lotus. And so my Lotus now is, since it's signed, some people might consider it worth like up to 12 grand. Some people would consider it only 10 grand. So but mine is like, it's just unlimited. And it, but if it was a beta and it was signed, it would probably be worth around $30,000. If it was played, if it was like mint, then I mean, a mint beta Lotus will go up to two hundred, four hundred thousand dollars Okay, so we kind of got, we got to let the audience know the difference, right? Well, a little bit on the technical technicalities. This is Mine's a- Mine's inside of a sleeve, but that's it. You can so see this the Christopher a, Rush signature on it. So it's an unlimited, right? So they are total of, of three, three sets that have the power nine. So the alpha, the beta, and the unlimited, right? Right. So, yeah. so, so you, you, you started out, uh, purchasing uh, your first Lotus at 300 and to in today and that, and at that time was it also an unlimited Lotus or yeah my it... very first was unlimited and then okay. my second Lotus I I sold the unlimited and bought a beta okay and I had that beta until the end of college and then when I graduated this was like in the year 2000 I had no idea where magic was gonna go I mean it very much felt like it could be in a bubble because the cards had so much value. And I had credit card debt to pay off. So I, so at the end of college, I sold the main part of my collection and I just kept a few extras, but I sold the main part for like $4,000. And that was actually quite a bit more than I bought it for. So I felt like I'd done well. And that was in the year 2000. And then in the year 2004, five, I really missed the game and the values had gone up. So I started buying back in. And so my fourth Lotus was unlimited and it was like a, dead mint it was except it had what was called like a roller line that went like across the back the like standard some of them had a very line. specific print defect yep. so mine was literally mint except for that um and so like i bought like that and that's why i rebought power nine and i bought them in unlimited that time and what that was, was your what was your thought process why were you willing to continuously play uh sorry pay a higher price despite the fact that your very first lotus was 300 and then obviously you came back to it later right. uh, you sold and upgraded right after yep. you cleared your debt i assume right yep yep so so that so at that point you were already a working adult right yes i okay. was i was an engineer working for intel designing motherboards yeah okay so May I ask, during that era, right, what was truly hot? Was, was gaming hot at the time? Was, was online games relatively big already for that era? Or it was still kind of, you know, not as popular? That's why you still, um, you know, kind of went back to Magic. That were like, as far as I can remember, like they were commanding like very large amounts of value. Even like the, the newer Magic sets had some decent value. But the older stuff was still like, uh, it's always been like a tier above where like all the newer sets were. But I don't remember anything else like commanding like tons of like value as a collectible mm. besides magic. I mean, Pokemon and stuff was out, but like, I mean, they were never like even close to the values at those days, like, you know, where magic was basically out for these really old expensive cards. I remember a lot of people around me dumping an awful lot of money in their land gaming rigs, you know, their PCs, okay. you know, for right. very expensive video cards and things like that to have a really cool gaming setup. Right, But I mean, there wasn't a ton of money that I remember being dumped into gaming at that point or mm. that kind of collectible. So magic very much stood out, right? And we're getting into a very different ethos today, you know, for investing. Yes. Because I think the success of one asset class in like kind of collectible gaming really kind of paves the way for others. And there was a point where there was a beta Lotus at one point. I don't remember the exact year, but a beta Lotus sold for like $25,000. And that was like so much farther past everything else. And so, I mean, it, it made news, people heard about it, but what it really did is it got people for the first time to actually believe that these magic cards could actually like really have long-term value. And it, that's something your investors, I really want them to understand it's these things don't just happen. Like you don't suddenly say all card values go up. There'll be a couple specific ones that are like, like, like the Babe Ruth of baseball kind of cards, the big ones, they will go up first and then they'll get put out of the price range of most of the buyers in the market. And then what will happen is the other support cards will start kind of coming up like underneath them. And then what I've noticed happens is the support cards will come up. And then that one, like now they're getting closer. This one might go up a bit, but then at some point, People will look at it and be like, why am I going to pay $100 for a beta Lanoir Elf when I can go get a Mox 
a sapphire for like, you know, $1,200. And that was a real thing. That really happened just like in 2016, like beta Lanowar elves, which is like a common, they were, they shot up to like a hundred bucks each, but you could literally just go out and buy a mock sapphire, which was a, a very rare, powerful uh, power nine card. And it was like $1,200 at the time. And so the, the, these ratios were off, but you see that you see this kind of thing happen. Like certain ones will pop up, then others come up and then like the market will rebalance and those other ones go higher. Well, now you've got a, a graded mint. I think it's a, it was an alpha Lotus that was like graded super high, went for like $400,000, right? Yes. And so now like, you know, that hundred dollar Lana world doesn't sound like anything big whatsoever. And so, but the point is like, you see these things, they kind of stair step each other. And that's like an interesting thing, but every time you do, and it's not just investor buyouts, it's actually organic. People just want the asset. Then that gives a little bit more confidence. And you don't see um, the confidence in the market. You don't see it on the way up. And especially crypto people need to understand that because crypto people get all excited when prices go up. But then when prices go down, it's like, you know, the sky is falling, people freak out and stuff. Well, what I want, the message I want you guys to understand is you find out the strength of the market in the times when it's going down, because that's when you see how many people were only there to make a buck, how many people will actually believe in it long term. What is the real strength of this asset, right? If it was more fear based because everybody was only in that asset to make a buck, then they all exit and that price really drops, right? And so that's a strong indicator. But if you see a pullback and like, you know, like if you look at magic cards in 2015 to 2000, like late 17, they went up like crazy. And then from like late 2017, early 2018 until like, I'd say the start of 2020, there was like a pullback in the vintage market. And that pullback, like, sure, the price came down, but it didn't come down that much. And yeah. that's really key. And that indicated an awful lot of strength. And not only in the market, but it also meant that these very few number of assets were in what's what you call in financial world, you call it strong hands. Mm -hmm. The people that could barely afford to hold on to the cards they had, most of those people had already sold. And the people who now owned these expensive cards were the people that they didn't have to sell them, you know, to have like, you know, wealth. They, they weren't pressured to sell it. They were they're a stronger hand that can hold on to an asset long term. And so it's, it's a phase in financial world. you see like a consolidation of a market that happens when an asset starts dropping for a little bit, it finds its real market strength. So that's the consolidation where like the tons of people sell the asset and the bigger whales come in and scoop up the asset. So they consolidate into a smaller number of holders. And then when that asset starts going up again, those, those big strong hands are still holding on to that asset as it's going up. Magic just went through that. And so it's an incredibly bullish indicator that it barely fell from 2016 to now 2020 after it massively ran up. I mean, and we're talking like hundreds of percents, right? I mean, like thousands of percents in some cards. Some of them were just massive. I saw cards go from 30 bucks to $500 on some of them. So it's just, it's crazy. No, I'm surprised that, um, you know, that you mentioned this because I was actually, um, when I when I stepped in, um, it was already kind of the consolidation period, okay? I was, I, I'm considered late in that sense, but at least it was after the consolidation period. period. So I kind of still bought certain things high, but there were certain things that I thought were high actually went higher. So so that's that's very interesting for me because I never expected a, a tangible item such as Magic the Gathering, right? Being, um, I would say it's liquid, but it's not as easy to sell off or, or, or even buy like stocks and shares or even crypto or anything that is digital, right? There's a very specific reason for that that needs to be understood. Sure. So Go that ahead. reason is because anytime you are trading in an incredibly rare asset, then the number of buyers of that asset gets smaller. Now, like take something like that $400,000 mint graded alpha lotus right now does everyone in the world want it absolutely yes now can everyone in the world afford it well absolutely not mm -hmm. and so if you're going to put an asset like that out there and you're going to say i want four hundred thousand dollars for it now anything in this world is worth what somebody is willing to pay for it 
So if you put it out there and it doesn't sell for three months, does that mean it wasn't worth $400,000? No, no. What it means is you have an extremely small market of buyers and you have to wait for the right buyer, not only being the right buyer, but having the money to invest in it. They've already got all their other ducks in a row and they're willing to take that plunge. And at that kind of level, people tend to kind of want to look at things a little bit closer and be sure of what they're doing. Now, take that theory and just kind of expand it a little bit. Because remember, you've only got, you know, so north, a little bit north of a thousand alpha rares that were printed, a little bit more than 3,300 beta rares, and a little bit more than like 15,000 unlimited rares. So they're in the level of thousands. But when you compare this to other things that are like in the millions of copies, and you get a sense of how rare these are, but then you even look at it and think, well, at any moment, you know, there's probably less than 2% of those alpha, of any certain alpha beta unlimited rare being sold right now. Like if you mm -hmm. go on eBay and there's only like three lotuses for sale, remember that's out of like 18,000, right? Yeah. So there's only like a few of them that are out there in the market. And they, the market is a place where buyers meet sellers. So if there's three of them sitting there and they've been sitting there for sale for a bit, then you've probably found somewhat of a balance where buyers meet sellers. If you had suddenly a hundred buyers that were all wanting to buy it, then you wouldn't have three on the market. So you hit this equilibrium, but the market's incredibly small and you feel that impact when you're trying to sell. So are they liquid? Yes, decently liquid, but can you like immediately sell them? Well, no, this isn't something like a Microsoft stock where you've got you know, 10 million shares of stock and every single day you've got 100,000 people that are buying and 100,000 people that are selling. This isn't that. This isn't an asset where you have as many people. It's a much smaller pool of buyers and sellers. I think, I think for, for a start, when I, when I step back into it, right, I had the, okay, so I had a few, I had a few concerns, right? Firstly, A, um, how would I validate or authenticate the, the, the product, right? At the same time, what was the right price that I was paid? Would I, sorry, would I be paying the right price for this particular card? Because there are various websites that can kind of give you an indicator. Now, eBay completed sales is one of them. Like, like you can kind of take reference. Yeah. But yeah, exactly, right? And then right. there's MKM, which is for the European market, TCG right. player for the US market. Now, I think the audience would kind of want to know, like if they were interested in purchasing their very first card, right? I think how would they first A, know that it's an authentic card? And second, how would they know that they're paying the right price for it? Okay, so let's let's deal with the authentic piece first. Um, there is an entire set of things that you can do to verify a card is real. It is, it is a verifiable thing. Okay. You can determine it, but you need to learn what you're doing. And so your only two options, and these are the only two options, is you either need to connect with somebody in the community that, first of all, you trust, but that actually has the ability to recognize a real card. And sometimes you know, if, they, if the, the better you are recognizing them, the less time it'll take you. Like I can spot one, like I can eyeball it at this point and have like 95% sure just by eyeballing the card. But if I take it out of a sleeve and look at it closer, like 100%, I don't even need a loop. But um, some people might actually need a jeweler's loop to look at it and tell like if it's a real card or not. And so if you are going to invest in them, you either need to learn yourself how to recognize them or you actually need to connect with somebody who can't. And there's no other way around that. And there's way too many things to go into in this video about how to recognize them. Some of which not everybody even wants to like make public because they don't want counterfeiters out there to like get another leg up and another possibility to try to counterfeit. But there's, yeah, there's an awful lot of ways. But take solace in the fact, though, that these cards were made 26 years ago on card stock that doesn't exist anymore. And not only was the printing process worse back then, which actually makes them harder to counterfeit, because you can actually, something that's a near-perfect printing, you can counterfeit that more easily. But an older printing with all the dots that are slightly shifted you get in there with the jeweler's loop and you can look for the errors in that normal print pattern and the same errors are there. That's nearly impossible, if not impossible to counterfeit. And so the lack of good printing before is actually one of its best protections for verifying cards are real. But anyways, yeah, you need to connect with somebody. 
I think now the I, other part, I, I think, I think maybe I kind of give them a little bit, right? Because I think giving them something would be helpful, like font. I think the mana registration and of course, looking at the borders are very important. Now, personally for me, very quickly, I bought the um, original cards from the largest online retailers, right? Firstly, A, I got buyer's protection in the event that it turns out to be not authentic, all right? I'll get a money back guarantee. The, the next thing was, after I realized the definitely I was I was confident and of course I verified with members of the community as you mentioned right people that I can trust or people you can trust that the card is already authentic right because I bought it from say um, Card Kingdom or Hariruya you know all these large co uh, companies like they get ripped off from exact the exactly That's very true exactly I mean it does happen but it's like it's very rare. very rare it's very rare. Cards. And, and as long as you kind of can validate that it was fake, because people do make mistakes and they do they do have large collection, by, uh, they, they, they're always buying cards. So after all, every, every staff has to verify the card and sure, there are some that slip through the cracks, but the likelihood of that being um, fake is lower than if you were to kind of venture out there in the wild on your own, right? Um, so after I bought my- also mentioned when people buy from a major vendor, that also means they're gonna pay more of a premium. If you go yes, on eBay and yes. buy a car, you'll get a better price, but you're taking more risk. Exactly. So I, so I was willing and I was fully aware that I'm paying a premium, right? Uh, my, my friend who is, of course, very, uh, uh, he's a, a very, very experienced in his business. You paid the tourist price, as they say. But I say that I have to pay the tourist price because if I don't know what an authentic card looks, feels like, or smells like, then how am I going to have the confidence to go out there and buy from other players? Or um, when the, the card comes from, say, an eBay seller who is just maybe having a few sales or whatnot, Sometimes the, the ones with the least sales are the ones that give you the best deals. So that's mm -hmm. something like I, I kind of, you know, started to have the more, more confidence to do. But anyway, uh, after doing that, I started to be more confident. So that's the moral of the story. So your very first card, always buy from your either your local um, uh, local shop, right? A store, right? That you can trust. And, you know, the community, like when you see a lot of old school players that are congregating there, you more or less know that that shop has that, heart, that level of credibility, right? The next thing, if you don't have one in your area, I think the best is to just buy, like me, pay a premium, obviously, and buy from an online store. After you have built that confidence, then you can kind of venture out into other smaller markets like Facebook, Discord, you know, and of course, naturally to buy from convention, so on and so forth with, uh, from you other players. You definitely be putting effort into learning the tricks yourself. Also. Definitely, but, definitely. But Yes. Okay. So next, the price. How do I know that I'm paying a fair price or the right price? Now, this is a tough subject because the first thing that people have to understand is the higher the value and the more rare the card is, the less you can verify the price. For instance, if you are going to buy like a black Lotus like mine, you know, that's like an unlimited played condition Lotus. Well, there was 15,000 unlimited Lotuses that were um, purchased. Most of them have some playware because this game existed before people even realized mm. they needed to protect their cards. Yeah. So there's a lot more of them that will actually transact. So you look at a card like that and you might have 20, 30 transactions that you can find online that actually happen for that card. And the more transactions, the more you can verify a market price. Sure. But if you look at something like a very high graded like BGS or PSA, like nine or 10, of mm -hmm. that card, there's not very many of them out there. In fact, I, I know of three BGS 10 Black Lotuses. Uh, one of them, my friend Open Boosters actually owns. And so there's, there's not a lot of them and they do not trade hands very often. And so the higher grade, higher dollar you go, the more it is a little bit unknown. And maybe the last time that BGS 10 card sold, it sold for like five grand. And then a year later, the next guy says he wants 14 grand, right? Well, the thing is, if he's the only guy that's got that card and nobody else can come into the market and compete with that price, maybe that's what the price is. And then maybe somebody comes in and negotiates it and he sells it at 13 and a half thousand. And then you look at it and think, dude, I could have bought it at seven. Mm -hmm. That happens. And so that is much, that takes a lot more skill because there is a lot less data to verify. And the only good way that I think to do that is you have to have a sense of how the game works and know what's a good card and what isn't because you don't want to like go off and spend a bunch of money on a card. That's really honestly not a very good card. It's just, it's old and it's rare. 
but it's not a good card in the game. So the only people who want it are investors, which mm -hmm. basically means your market of buyers goes from this, which is like players and collectors, investors. It shrinks down to just the collectors, investors that want it, which is a smaller card pool, which will probably translate into a lower price. But to give you just numbers of how intense this can be, um, there's a card called Farmstead in beta that it's a terrible card. It's horrible. I've literally never played it in a deck, right? <laughs> I like the picture and stuff, but I've never played it. And I know of an of uh, a collector slash investor that found like the only BGS 10 one that ever existed. And it was on auction and he bid it up to $9,000 for this card. And he lost the auction. So he reached out to the guy and offered like $14,000. And the guy who actually bought it for nine told him to go F himself. <laughs> and, and that's Farmstead. I mean, that's a terrible card. Like, whereas like, you know, the card I just showed you, my Unlimited Lotus is considered one of the best cards that's ever been made. And you can buy a played Unlimited for like nine or $10,000 mm, somewhere yeah. around there. Yeah, around there. Eight, so, eight, eight issue, you still can get one. Yeah. Yeah. So you yeah. get a sense of like the collective collectability and the rarity is an aspect, but you got to keep in mind that Farmstead BGS 10 was 14,000, while the Beta Lotus or Alpha Lotus BGS 10 was like 40, 400,000, right? Is it relative? Yeah. But like you, you're not going to get data in that market. And therefore, you have to know the cards. You have to know like somewhat about what their last prices were the last time they sold. You have to have some sense of what their value is. And you're not going to get that unless you're actively involved in the game. So for your investors, I would suggest they probably stick to um, the, if they want data, if they just want to be involved with like just the data, you probably want to stick to the, don't buy damaged cards, but buy like the LP condition up to the near mint minus that might grade like an eight, five or lower or something like that that'll be much safer. If you get into the higher range, your potential for profit is higher, but also your potential to get taken for a ride is much higher also. So, so okay, so I kind of like want to um, dive in a little bit on that because I think uh, what you just mentioned was firstly graded and raw cuts. So yeah. I think raw cuts are, are obviously uh, not going to charge as high a premium compared to graded cards, right? But Generally. I think most people may not understand. And because of all the hype from Pokemon, right? They are going to be very, um, they're going to FOMO and they're going to FOMO and think that every time it's always um, 9.5, 10, 9.5, 10, or even just 10, right? I think a lot of people are going to uh, find out that eventually, right? That you probably, okay, the possibility of getting a, a um, 9.5, okay, say, say 9. Okay, let's be realistic. Let's say 9. Yeah. Is it still pos possible to find a raw cut out there in the wild? It's and incredibly rare. It's incredibly rare, okay. And the reason why it's incredibly rare is like you have to know the history of Magic. When this, this game was made, there was no collectible card games and people had no idea these were going to have any value. And those early sets got completely played unsleeved. And so they all mm. got a little bit beat up. It wasn't until a couple of years in when people started realizing these would have value and start actually finding ways to protect them. And I think, I think when I started in 1996, I was grabbing just like baseball card protectors and they were like really loose. You could barely shuffle it. And I was like shuffling decks with that. And when, when deck protectors finally came out, it was like a godsend because you could finally protect them. Long story short, is finding ones that even if they printed in good condition and the printing was very erratic back then, even if they printed good enough to be graded a 10, they probably got played and they got beat up. So finding one that's not the newer cards, the older cards that actually are in good enough condition to grade a nine or a 10 is incredibly rare because they, they might've popped out of the actual packaging fresh out of the booster pack, but they're gonna grade like a seven or a six because they have a roller line on the back or the centering is off really bad or something like that, or there's a nick on it or something like that. So there was a very small number of them that were even capable of nines or tens. And then of those ones, now it's the ones that have actually like not been played. And there is a very small number of sealed boxes and things out there. So these cards that are popping out of these boxes at a high grade, they're incredibly rare. I mean, you can, probably count on like you know one hand the number of bgs 10 anything alpha beta unlimited right 
it's it's a very small number. So so can I verify that limit that limit that number um, anywhere? Can you? Oh yeah. So well, kind of yes and no. Mm. Well, you you can go to PSA and you can look because when they grade a card, they'll put it into their registry. And so you would think that, well, I can just look there and see how many like nines and tens there are, how many eights there are. But the place, the thing that you have to understand is the farther down you go in the grading, when you look at the archives, mm -hmm. the less trusted it is. Because what yes. people will do is they'll take a card. Buy and crack it. Yeah, they'll crack it because like they'll get an eight five and be like, I don't think that grader did a good job. And they'll yep. crack it and send it back. They in. send it back again. Yes. And they might do that a couple times until maybe it comes back like a nine and then they'll keep it. Right. And so like you have all these graded eight fives and sevens that don't actually exist anymore. Correct. And the serial number no longer, I mean, it exists in the registry, but as in, if you wanted to find it out in the wild, it's probably not there. Yep. And so there is nobody that has the exact number of how many high grade cards there are. But um, from experience, I can tell you it's a very small number. It is, there is not hundreds and hundreds. Like of, if you go to newer cards, you know, you can crack open a box and, and get it graded like a nine or a 10 easy because the print process is much more tight these days. But and would you, what, what, why would, why would anyone do that? Like a new set? Is that okay? So firstly, is oh, that just, worth, just is that worth understand. doing? Is that worth doing these days? No. Okay. No, because the cost and the time it required for grading is so high that it's just not worth it. Okay. So the, but, the but cost is, and the turnaround time. Yeah. Okay. I mean, you might pay $25 a card and wait a year and a half to get it back. So, oh, I mean, it's horrible. You, if you had a, a $30 card, right? And then you sent it in for grading. Let's even assume it came back a BGS 10, right? There's probably literally like a hundred thousand other cards that could get that same grade. And um, so first of all, it's not that rare. I mean, you're the guy that actually paid to have it graded, but people know that it's not hard to get a high graded card. So they're not going to respect that grade. And also the newer cards have this big problem, like within like a year of time, their value might drop from 30 bucks a card down to like five or $4 because they rotate out of the latest set. Nobody's playing with it anymore. And therefore the cards value just tanks. So, you, so you had a $30 card, you spent 25 bucks getting it graded. And then a year and a half later, when you get it back, the whole, the card itself was worth five bucks and maybe somebody will give you 10 for it. Cause it's actually graded. It's just, no, it's not worth it for the newer stuff. What I find it, what I find also very interesting, because it's a game, right? At the end of the day, it's still it's still playable, and the cards actually have a use case, as they say, right? Because they can be very functional in uh, certain types of decks or in a majority of decks. Hence, as you mentioned, the more playable it is, and it's used by both players and investors, they tend mm -hmm. to either hold value or eventually have steady stable growth over a certain period of time could you kind of let's say if i'm totally new i'm totally new to this right should i approach it as okay i'm totally new i don't have any knowledge of how to play the game but after watching this video i'm willing to diversify a small portion of my liquidity or my liquid cash into this how should i go about approaching it um, well, you should, well, I, I think say I'm your friend, I'm say I'm your friend and this is non-financial advice. I mean, <laughs> I'm just your friend and I just want to really know because I see you doing it right. Uh, or I yeah. see uh, Ryan doing it right. I'm just curious. How can I get in on the action? Well, let me, let me first touch on the point you were starting to sure. talk about really quick. So sure. take like these cards. These are actual power nine cards. I've got two sure. unlimited and two betas. Here. Okay. Yeah. And so these ones are only legal in like vintage and old school, not a lot of formats, right? Mm. Yes. But they have a lot of, a lot of value. Now these two cards, this is an, a beta demonic tutor and this is a beta soul ring. Mm -hmm. These are allowed in many more formats. Mm -hmm. And so the, the total value of these cards is lower than those ones because they're much more common. In fact, these are literally uncommons and those ones are rares. Okay. But they're allowed in more sets. And so being able to play this in like a commander deck or like, you know, something like legacy or something like that. Uh, well, I don't know if these are probably legacy, but anyways, being able to play them in more formats brings that value back up. And so every individual card, and this is the key point I want you to understand or your viewers, every single card is its own case study because there's sets they're allowed, sets they're not. There's decks they work in, decks they don't work in. And then there's a demand for the card and there's a certain print run of the card and there's the set that's been made in 
every individual card, it could, you could literally write its own four page document on its actual value. And it just, there's no way around that. It takes time to figure that out. Okay, now, so if I was gonna recommend somebody getting into magic, there is one rock solid way better than any to actually get into magic for the best value, which is I, what I assume your investors want. The best way to possibly do it is get the largest pile of cash you possibly can. And I mean like cash. And then spend the time to plug yourself into the community enough to where you could be connected to somebody who's selling a very large collection that you believe to be real, right? And once you've done those works and that, that's not wasted effort, it's worth it, right? You don't wanna buy cards onesie twosie here if you want your best price. Get, get the largest pool of money you can, get connected to, to people that have these older cards, you're sure real. And when they say, okay, I'm selling my collection, I'm asking for $50,000, then say, here's $35,000 cash. I'll buy the whole thing. And if it's like, it's money right there on the table or they can see it and they're ready to buy it, I mean, sell it. Then oftentimes people will take that deal. And then you look at the amount of money you save getting all of them. It's, it's massive. And so there's, there's no better way I know of to buy cards at a better price. But a lot of people don't have that kind of money. And so they mm. end up like buying the cards one at a time as they can actually invest it. Mm -hmm. And you're not going to get the same deals buying them one at a time. You're going to get much worse deals, but you can kind of slowly work your way in and kind of learn the, the game. So maybe for your first couple, at least it's a good idea to do that because then you can get, you can start to recognize what's a real card. What isn't, you can start to learn, you know, the actual, um, the things to look for and what the market is, you'll start, once you're invested, you'll start paying more attention to it and stuff like that. So yeah, maybe okay. buy a couple at the beginning, but then try to come in with a large chunk of money. Okay. So let's, let's, let's kind of dissect this a little bit because I, I think at the end of the day, right, people may not know how difficult uh, that is to do. Say, assume, assuming that they have that lump sum, but it's hard to find people, especially around the world, right? We're talking about, it's an international thing, but however, the largest collections are still always available only in the Euro, uh, in Europe, UK, and the US. So if I'm someone in Asia- it's a very small market. That, that's the key point there. Exactly. So how am I- so, so, there, It's that how, the market is incredibly small. Yes. So how am I, even if I have the cash, I have 50 grand, for example, how mm -hmm. am I going to buy a large collection when- the availability or the ability to do that, especially during this period of time, how is that still achievable? Like, how do we do that? You have to, you just have to start plugging in. You have to start getting connected to um, the community. You have to like start following where the cards are being bought and sold. You have to get to know people because a lot of this travels like word of mouth. That's because that's also a way to verify, right? Mm -hmm. And I mean, let's talk, let, let's keep in mind what you're talking about. You're talking about investors with no knowledge coming into something yes. that's incredibly rare, mm. very knowledge intensive. Uh, every card is its own case study. You can't shortcut this process. You can't come in without any knowledge and expect that you're going to safely dump money into this without like doing some research, hooking up with someone that actually knows it. You're, you're just going to be easy pickings for somebody to take advantage of. You can't shortcut that process. This is way too complicated. Okay. That. So if that approach, right, um, let's assume that that approach is uh, uh, available only after an X amount of time. So sure. the fa so what about a faster way? Let's say with a smaller ticket size, say, say a monthly amount of say $500. Is this uh, still achievable? It's still achievable, but what you're probably going to end up doing is you at least need to be able to learn at least to some extent to recognize what's a real card that's for sale. And then um, you've got to narrow in on like a certain smaller set of cards that you're targeting for buying. I mean, just go for like alpha beta Arabian nights, something like that. And then as your budget allows, just buy them from like these major stores, like, you know, card kingdom, star city games, channel fireball, um, power nine games, you know, just start buying them from those places that that's one way to get it. No, you're not going to get the best prices. 
um, you're not going to get this like huge collection in one shot, but you are going to get a foothold in the market. You are going to start to build up a position in some of those cards. Um, and just be based on the fact that usually when people are invested in something, they start having more emotion tied into it and they'll start be wanting to learn more about it and investing more time and energy into it. And I think all of that will just naturally happen as you move into it. Right. So yeah, that would probably be the way to do it is like stick with the larger stores and stuff at the beginning, unless you luck out and you have somebody locally that plays this format, knows these cards and, you know, you can actually lean on that person for experience, you know, for help and advice. They can, they can always uh, email you, right? <laughs> I don't want the whole <laughs> world. <laughs> so, no, no. <laughs> Is it, I don't okay. have time. Just, okay, so I kind of want to cover a little bit about that, right? The community effort that you have made, which is, of course, setting up your channel, Edwin the Magic Engineer. So that is really a very cute uh, 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 channel. When I was, I was like, okay, like, I didn't know that there's such an engineer. So, so kind of share a little bit about your channel and why did you even start? I mean, you're a busy individual and, and, yeah. and to, for the fact that you have dedicated a lot of time, right? Building mm -hmm. and creating content about this is something that I find very rare, to be very frank. And you yeah. are someone that doesn't open packs on your channel. You're really talking about... So, so guys, he's like one of the OGs, right? He started a channel not with the intention to sell cards. He's right. literally talking about the deck tech, meaning that if you were a player and you're building a deck, and he would share about why these cards are important, how the deck functions, so you get better at the game. That's one. The second, he would cover the, the finance. He would cover how do you get into the game, and at the same time, how do you even uh, uh, proxy, say, for example, if you want to play the game, how do you make good quality? A lot of content, guys. So, Edwin, I, I only have, I probably only covered the tip of the iceberg, but I want to let the audience know why you created the channel. Sure. Could you please share that part? Sure. So the first thing that should be understood is like, this is something you mentioned like before when we were talking that there is like a section of people that consider investing in magic a very evil thing and like it's terrible to do. Mm -hmm. And so um, if people are going to invest in it, they need to understand what that mindset is. And when I explain my channel, it'll tie I want to ask the question. Quick, I want to quickly dive in. Why yeah. do people think that investing in magic is evil? Why? That's what I'm, I'm just about to talk about. Right, why, yeah. When I explain my channel, it won't make sense unless I describe this. Sure. So there's an awful lot of people out there that they just wanted to play old school they, and the, the format that has all these old cards and they didn't necessarily want the cards to go up in value. But so okay. like kind of like were, they were wanting to have their cake and eat it too because they wanted the world to know that there's this really cool format called old school and that right. people were actually playing it and a lot of these really old cards, they're banned from like everything new, but they were all, so for, even though these cards are very rare and stuff, they were actually um, not able to be used in a lot of formats, but old school came out and it gave them people a place to actually play their cards again. And so these guys wanted people to know that there's a format for them, but they didn't want the card values to go up because they also were still trying to buy and collect and sure. get their cards. Sure. And so some of them look at this thing like this is just a game. And even though magic's never been just a game, that's not a correct viewpoint. Exactly. They get it in their heads that it's just a game. And so therefore, when they think it's just a game, when people invest in it, they look at it like, oh, well, these evil investors are ruining my game, which is, first of all, that's not true because it's never been just a game. It's always been some aspect of collectability and investment, always, from day one, right? So, so there's people that think that. And then there's also people that don't want the card values to go up because um, they still have a bunch of cards to buy. And then these cards are running faster away from them than they can actually- And they can actually faster. save and make money and buy it. Yes. Right. Okay. So there is an aspect to where if you're like, you're known as an investor in magic and you're considered evil. Now, um, I actually don't do a lot of investment. I do some investment with it because like I'm mostly from the aspect of a player. I, I made my channel and I do this game because I honestly just, I love the game. I like the collectability aspect. I think it's fun because I, I enjoy finance as a topic. I enjoy it. I like trading stocks and I like seeing like how investments move. And it's very interesting to me how these things actually ebb and flow. And that's the reason really why I made the channel. I'll come back to that though in a second. But I just had to hit a point years ago where I kind of made my peace with it. 
right? Where I just had to look at it and say, okay, you know what? You can't stop people from investing in this. It is what it is. It is an incredibly rare asset. People do actually want it. And if I do actually want to play with my cards, but if I play with them and a format gets created, then the value is going to shoot up. It's just, it is what it is. You can't change it. And I'm a believer that if you have something in life that you can't change, just make the best of it. And so in that viewpoint of like, okay, if I can't stop it from being an investment, I don't have to necessarily encourage the investment, but at least like I can realize that that's what it is. And so then I can put my investor hat on and figure out how to finish building my decks while I'm actually like enjoying playing the game, making videos and stuff. And so I started taking that aspect and I made my channel with the perspective of, I'm going to focus on the plane. I'm going to focus on the deck techs. I'm going to focus mostly on that. But I, I started making investment videos, not for the purpose of enabling investors, but I made my, my investment videos for the purpose of helping players understand how the card values were going to change. And at that time, I was literally, I mean, if you look at my videos from 2016, I was literally telling people, look, you guys, these cards are going to go up in value go get these cards first and like, just don't wait. I mean, you're not going to have time left over. And I was sounding the bells like to like, let people know, like if you're a, a player and you're missing cards, go get them. Don't wait. And at that time, unfortunately the investors were watching also. And what started happening is and a lot of investors started watching my channel. And every time I would call out a card, I mean, this is like for five months, I would say strip mine is an incredibly good card for decks. At the time I said strip mine, it was a $10 card, even for antiquities. And I've made a post on Instagram about it. I called it out and said, you guys, every deck wants four strip mines. And you see, there's not a lot of antiquity strip mines. They're an incredibly good card. There's not a lot of black borders out there. Go get your black borders. And then like one week later, strip mine hit like a hundred bucks. And then that happened with like Lanoirs and it happened with Chaos Orbs and it happened with Time Vault and Shaharazad. There was all these cards that like I specifically said, here's a card, it's undervalued, go get your card. And then the investors would run out and buy it as well as players. So it became a thing about the tail wagging the dog kind of thing, mm -hmm. where like suddenly like I noticed like it was the investors that were following my channel and I wasn't trying to enable the investment community. So I stopped calling out which cards are gonna go up in value because I didn't, I didn't want to like, first of all, make the other players in the world hate me, but I didn't want to like, you know, um, I didn't necessarily want to drive the values if I was just trying to help the players, you know, I didn't identify want where like two years later, they're like, I missed it. Like I, nobody told me these were going to go up in value and now they're all too yes. expensive for me. I was yes. trying to ring that bell and tell them like, this is where this is going guys. And that's kind of like the only way, right? And it becomes like a so-called double edged sword. One yeah. aspect is that you mean well for the people, the community, the players, because you already mentioned that you are a player yourself, right? Yep. And I'm you majority and player, not investor. I have investment in magic, but I'm majority a sure. player. Exactly. So, but you cannot deny the fact that if and the best medium is always social media, right? And since you already had a channel with with a decent following, I think what you did was the right thing. But however, by calling out the card. It also, and, and like I said, people who identify finance well will follow the right people. Like, mm -hmm. I, I don't really follow just box opening videos because I feel that that's entertaining. Nothing wrong with it, but it, yeah, doesn't, it doesn't give me a direction. It's just entertainment. It's nice. Yeah, it's, investor, there's nothing there. There's nothing there for me. So yeah. I always want to identify because... I may not play the game. Let's say, for example, if I'm just a collector, I do not want to play the game. I'm really interested in what can make me money over a, a certain time horizon. I think that's the most important, right? And as long as it's in demand, as you say, right? Mm -hmm. And it holds value and has steady growth over time. That's what every investor wants. And I think that has to just be the thing. And I think you hit the nail on the head when you say you cannot deny the fact that this is not just a collectible. It's not just yeah. a hobby, but it's a yeah. market. It's a, it's a financial market. It's just that it's in the alternative investments, right? So question now, I think, and also the and, probably and one of the last questions. The next part, let me add one piece sure, on. Sure, sure, sure. Um, the reason why I'm willing to even do this interview with you and talk about it as an investment is because like I'm revealing nothing here. The cat's out of the bag. 
the world knows that magic cards are being treated as an investment. Mm. And so if people didn't learn that in the last like two years, that there is an investment crew out there that's going to come invest in cards, then like, I mean, you deserve what, what you get. I mean, everybody told you, I told you this, it is what it is. And so if you're not going to be able to stop that train, you might as well like understand it and make your bet and make your best piece with it. And this is the reason why I like for playing the game, I evangelize proxies so much because people that like proxies or they allow proxies. Well, now if you have some real cards and you have some proxies, now you can actually play the game, even though investors are driving these cards up because again, well, not again, I hadn't said it yet, but the reserve list is never going to be broken. Never going to be broken. <laughs> I, I, always, like, yeah. I always hear a lot of content you know, about that. Like break the reserve list, get rid of it. The moment the if reserve wanna... list is gone, everything <laughs> is going to go to zero. I always hear that. And then, you know, there's always the magic is dead, right? Magic has been dead many, many times throughout the history of magic, yeah. which is very much if the same. Want, like, Within three minutes, I can concretely prove to you the reserve list will never be broken. Three in three minutes, I can concretely prove it. Let's hear it. Okay, so the here's here it is in a nutshell. The total market cap, and you guys are investors, you know what market cap means. The total market cap of reserve list cards is somewhere between five and ten billion dollars, right? If the reserve list was to not even be broken, if Wizards of the Coast was even just said they're thinking about reprinting cards you could have a large number of people holding those cards rushing to the secondary market to sell their cards and this overwhelm of supply with no demand tanks the prices the tanking of prices is the damages and the damages is what the lawsuits would be filed for because the damages are the actual financial losses now wizards of the coast they they did not write a written contract saying they're not going to reprint but they did actually publicly promise it, my gosh, probably 40, 50 times over, over the last like 24 years. They, they said it in written public um, statements. They, they did articles about it. They did videos about it. And every single time they promised never to reprint the reserve list was another time with that many more years or whatever of time knowing what the secondary market is doing that they were still certifying they're never gonna redo it. And so under a legal term called promissory estoppel, which basically says like you can do a legally implied contract and it, it is a real thing um, that this would be probably the landmark case of promissory estoppel. There's no way wizards would be able to claim that they didn't know that the secondary market was going to be affected by it, right? So, and there's, there's videos that have been posted around the internet and stuff. So yes, there's absolutely a legal case that would in fact be brought against them. And now here's where the numbers are important. Wizards of the Coast is a company that will make 200 million to 500 million uh, net profit within a year, right? And they're already making that money. And if they were to reprint reserve list cards, what are we thinking their profits are gonna double? No, no, not likely. Their profits will go up a little bit. Maybe their profit goes up $100 million within inside of one year from where they're currently at, right? But would, you, would any, you guys are investors, would any investor in the world say, okay, you're going to risk a five to $10 billion lawsuit that you're likely going to lose so you can possibly make another $100 million a year, right? So we're talking lose five to 10 billion so you can maybe make 20 to 100 billion. And that's, that's your risk reward, right? And at the same time, when you do that, you're irrevocably going to break the confidence of everybody inside of your game that's been buying these collectible tradable assets no one's going to believe anything you say ever again you are going to absolutely hammer all faith and investment in the things that you've done right so what company on the planet would risk a five to ten billion dollar lawsuit to make 20 to 100 million dollars of profit maybe right it's not going to happen the, the risk versus reward is completely off kilter. And it doesn't even matter so much. Even everybody talks about, well, they, they're going to lose the lawsuit, right? I think they're going to win. People come up with these opinions and stuff like that. But that's not even the, the thing. Even if they won the lawsuit, they've still lost face. They've still spent huge amounts of money. They've still like broken the confidence of all the players around the world. It's just, and, and honestly, they would likely lose because there is so much evidence against them. With every passing year, every time they recertify the reserve list, 
that they're they're increasing the chances that they would lose that loss, not not break it. And so some people tried to come up with some terrible reasons. I've done videos on it, but that's really honestly that's the beginning and the end of it. The profit versus loss for the people that own the intellectual property is not there. And just before we wrap it up, I'll say a couple more things. Wizards of the Coast can't just like close their doors, say, we're going to close up Wizards. We're going to sell, you know, magic making to some other company and they're going to make it and they're not bound by the reserve list. That's not how liability works. If that was how liability works, you would have companies all the time in America just closing their doors. Their cousin now starts up the company and then they'd be like, hey, can't sue me. You, the, my cousin made the promise. That's not how liability works in America. You cannot get out of it that easily. If somebody else was to make the cards and they had, they bought the intellectual property from Wizards of the Coast, then they're also buying the liabilities as well as a target of lawsuit. So no, it's the reserve list is never, ever going away. No matter what idiot like Brian from Tularean Community College says, he doesn't know what the heck he's talking about. It's never going away. Once I realized that, it made me much more confident and willing to just start investing in these cards. And, and that's the thing, right? When I first started, because I was clueless, I never knew how to play the game, but I realized that the reserve list is important. And after hearing what you just shared, it really it, it gave me a lot of confidence to really sink my money into reserve list cards. And of course, high demand reserve list cards. We're not talking about, there are reserve, and guys, just take note, there are reserve list cards that are worthless, like literally the value has been stuck and stagnant for many, many years. We're talking about decades here. Which but illustrates then, the point about needing to know the game. Because exactly. like the playability of the card and the rarity comes into it. Exactly. And then there are the then and then there's another spectrum which are the reserve list cards that are always in high demand with high playability, right? And those are the ones that you want to put your money into. And that was how I started, you know, but that's a total another video. And uh Edwin Thank you so much for sharing all this information with uh, my audience and of course with me. I, I really greatly value this uh, this time. And of course, guys, don't forget to subscribe to uh, go and check out. Sorry, first go and check out Edwin, the magic engineer on YouTube, right? Subscribe to his channel. I have the link in the descriptions below. And of course, naturally, if you guys felt that this video was extremely valuable, right? Give it a thumbs up and don't forget to like, comment and subscribe. Perhaps, maybe, just maybe, if we get enough likes or comments, we can bring Edwin in for perhaps another episode to discuss further into this alternative asset class. All right, guys. So another thing about my channel before we sure, end. Sure. Um, I want to let people know that um, I'm doing a channel called Unhinged Magi with Open Boosters together. Sure. And that yes. one's more current event news type stuff. And, and you got to share who's, who's Open Boosters. You got to share that. Oh, okay. So I'll talk about that more in yeah, a second. Yeah, sure. You got to share that. That's a channel where um, people, I want people to know that the videos I made in Edwin the Magic Engineer, I did. I specifically avoided news type topics. I spoke about things that are a bit more timeless expressly for the purpose. So when people discover my channel and they go back and they watch old videos, it's not like you're watching yesterday's news. I'm talking about topics that are still relevant today. The entire channel is focused around that. Un unlike Unhinged Magi, where uh, Open Boosters and I are getting together and we talk about current events, we talk about fun topics, we're trying to do more daily videos. Edwin the Magic Engineer is very well researched, uh, understood, logically laid out videos of things that are a bit more timeless. Unhinged Magi is more kind of current newsy fun kind of oriented. Got you. All right. Is, 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 that, is that a wrap? Yeah, that's good. <laughs> All right, Edwin. So thank you so much for watching, guys, and we'll see you in the next video. Take care. God bless. Okay. Bye, everybody.